We've pursued one sense of representation now in following the projections from the primary sensory, cor primary sensory surfaces to primary sensory cortices. Even interpreting those as representations is controversial. There's a lot of debate as to how one should approach that. Just as maps relate to their underlying territory in many and different complex ways. But we're going to move on now to the much more um, influential and controversial debate about a different kind of representations. This is more like symbols now and less like imprints. Um, there has been a great deal of mystery surrounding a concept known as intentionality. What do we mean by intentionality? Intentionality is evoked when we say that something here is about something that's not here and we can no longer follow those traces. So to take an example, if this cat here is thinking about a cheeseburger, there's the cat, cat's thinking about a cheeseburger, the cheeseburger is not here. The sense here is that there, one could view that there ought to be something, there must be something in his brain activity, if that's where we want to look for it, that corresponds to a hypothetical cheeseburger. It doesn't correspond to a real cheeseburger, but it must be in correspondence with the, well, for lack of a better word, idea of a cheeseburger, right? So this is a neurocentric approach, and it is stock and trade of the computational theory of mind, in which patterns of ne neural activity the goings on in the brain, are interpreted in intentional terms. So that on this view, there should be some pattern of activity which is about the idea of a cheeseburger. And that's the intentional relationship. And if, if that exists, then we could argue the cat has a representation of a cheeseburger. And that representation stands for the cheeseburger within a system. That is his thinking system. Now, this is much more like the symbols that we met before. Now, even there, we met different degrees of um, arbitrariness. We met some things like the prohibition sign, which were entirely conventional, which bore no relation to the underlying sense of prohibition. We also saw these iconic elements in the context of a prohibition sign, where there was representations of fisher, fishing or fish to, to create a sign that said no fishing. So... If the cat has a representation of a cheeseburger, would that representation itself have to look like a cheeseburger? Would it in any way have to resemble a cheeseburger? If the cat also thinks of the taste of the cheeseburger, is there something like the taste of a cheeseburger in the paddle of neuron activity? Does, it, does that representation need any properties or is it entirely free floating? Need there be no similarity relation between the cheeseburger, between the pattern of activity here, which is taken to stand for a thought of a cheeseburger and a cheeseburger itself. If the relationship is 100% arbitrary and conventional, that's a purely symbolic relationship. I used the word iconic before, and I used it for those cases where there was some element in the sign which bore some kind of a resemblance or a likeness to the thing it was talking about. So... If thoughts are, as Jerry Fodor suggested, if thoughts are like sentences, then the thought, I want a cheeseburger, is much like the sentence. And what I'm asking now is whether the cheeseburger element in that sentence needs to be cheeseburgery, as the one on the screen is, or can it be entirely arbitrary? So instead of a cheeseburger, if the cat wants a pie, let's steal that symbol, which the mathematicians stole from the Greeks. Remember, they, the Greeks had a perfectly good letter of their alphabet working in that system. Mathematicians went along and co-opted the letter pi to make it work for a number in their system. So we're going to take it here and let it stand for the pi that we're thinking about eating. Now, clearly, this does not resemble a pi. Yeah. So does would a symbol have to resemble something or is it entirely arbitrary? Now, our familiarity with language would suggest that, well, no, arbitrariness is absolutely fine. We know that words, by and large, bear arbitrary relationships to things that they are about. And now we get to a really interesting and 
unsettled point. Remember Jerry Fodor, when he made the language of thought hypothesis, had suggested that some of our thought is language-like. He was never claiming that everything that goes on in your experiential life, or even everything you might think of as thought, is of that nature, but some of it was. Now, some of the manners in which you think about things are probably not sentence-like. So we went to move beyond sentence-like representations, and we're now venturing into the big debate in cognitive science between those who are really interested in sentence-like things, or propositions, and images. So, I want you to picture a hippopotamus. Use the fabulous power of your mind to imagine a hippopotamus. Now I'm going to suggest that that's probably not a sentence that just happened in your head. There's my hippopotamus. He's blue. Was your hippopotamus blue? If you can answer that question, then we have some interesting evidence because the word hippopotamus is neither blue nor not blue. But if you said to me, no, my hippopotamus was not blue, then there was something in your thought that was not of that arbitrary symbolic likes. There was something more iconic or image-like that allowed you to, as it were, refresh that thought and go, no, that wasn't blue. So mental images have occasioned a lot of debate. And by mental images, I mean when I say, imagine something and you, as we say, picture it in your mind. Now, where are those pictures? Are there pictures in the mind? This is what we're asking. Well, when you imagine something, we can ask you questions about it, like I just did. I just asked you, was your hippopotamus blue? And when I do this in class, the answer is almost inevitably, no, my hippopotamus was not blue. I don't think I've ever had anyone suggest that their hippopotamus was blue before I introduced the blue hippopotamus. There are other questions like, you can ask yourself of your own mental images. Are the elements spatially arranged? Was your hippopotamus pointing to the left or the right or straight on or from the rear? If you imagine more than one thing, can one thing block another one? Because they can in pictures. Are the elements fully specified? Now, maybe you couldn't answer my question about blueness. Was your um, hippopotamus wearing Wellington boots? Probably not, and you can probably answer that one. If the image is like a, a physical picture that you look at, it's fully specified. You can go back and you can query it and can check. Is it blue? Or is it wearing uh, Wellington boots? And so on. But that might not be the case when I ask you to picture something. And if you picture something, can it surprise you? Can you see things that you didn't think of? And here's an interesting point. Then we just put this in parentheses. We're not going to pursue it any further. But we're acting as if you're the same person thinking the same way all the time. But I can speak from personal experience that when I imagine something as I'm falling asleep, it often does surprise me. My imaginations tend to get febrile and run away with themselves as I'm in that st transition between waking and sleeping. I don't know if you're familiar with that. If you're fully awake and alert, maybe you have complete control over what you imagine, but is that the case all the time? There's lots of questions here, isn't there? But they're fun questions to follow. And so here we open up the great mental imagery debate. And this is between two groups of cognitive scientists, both of whom more or less subscribe to the idea of computational theory of mind and representation in activity patterns in the brain. But what they differ in is the nature of representation. Is it language-like, as we met with Jerry Fodor, or what role do images play? So this is a, um, is a complex debate. Uh, there are many ways you can address this. So when you're thinking, if those, if those thoughts are representational, are they using symbols? Are they using propositions? Are they using images? Because different ways of representing bring different properties to bear. Are there necessarily any similarity relations? So notice the big difference between a sentence and an image is that a sentence if it's really language-like and made up of words, has no necessary correspondence or similarity to the thing it stands for. Whereas an image does. An image must look like a thing or else it's not an image. Are they symbolic and to what extent are they symbolic? 
And underlying all this is the view that emerged after the cognitive turn in the middle of the 20th century, which saw brains as if they were big symbol manipulating machines. And the question is, what kind of symbols? Computers can handle images. Incidentally, there are images in your computer, but it does make a big difference. The kind of things you can do with images are very different from the kind of things you can do with sentence-like representations. So around about the early 1970s, the language of thought and generative linguistics played such a large role that there was a body of people who strongly believed that thought is language-like, is all based on propositions. And those who argued strongly for images wanted to produce evidence that thoughts can be image-like, that is, they have um, the properties of similarity that an image has. Now, an image looks like the thing it resembles, right? And there are certain spatial patterns which are preserved in an image. So here's a very famous set of experiments done by Shepard and others. The first ones was Shepard and Metzler in 1974. And what they did in these experiments was they would seat people in front of a screen and show them something like this and say, you see those two shapes? Are they, could they plausibly be the same shape? Now, in order to answer that, you have to perform a kind of gymnastics in your mind. You're not allowed to do drawings, you can't pick them up. You actually have to sort of see, could you rotate one onto the other? And if you did, oh, I'm having a hard time with this one now. I think that one rotates onto that one. Yep, yep, yep. But you make up your own mind there. It's, it's non-trivial. When you see that it's going to work, there's a moment where the penny drops. Um, that's the first example. The answer is yes, they do. Here's another one. Try that one. Can you mentally rotate one onto the other? You've probably made up your mind by now. In this case, the answer is also yes, they do. So it would be remiss of me not to show you one that didn't work. How about this one? It's like playing mental Tetris, isn't it? You're doing mental rotation, trying to get that. that. These two do not align. You could not map one onto another. So it's a difficult task. Some pairs of stimuli are going to be easier than others. And what they measured was the amount of time that it took people to respond correctly. If they get it wrong, we'll throw that out. How long does it take you to respond? And the data shown here are from a, a simpler form of this in which rotation was in the plane rather than three-dimensional. And so you could measure the amount that you would, if this was a real thing, you would have to rotate one in order to put it on top of the other. So rotation can go from zero to 180 degrees. Beyond that, we've gone past the maximum rotation and we're going back. So the x-axis here from zero to 180 represents the full scale of rotations. The y-axis represents the response time and there's two different data sets plotted. Those in which the answer was yes, they're the same trials, and those in which the answer is no, they're the different trials. It shouldn't surprise you that it takes longer if the answer is no because you, you're kind of dissatisfied and you try again and you're not sure. Whereas if you've done the mental rotation and had that satisfying Tetris-like click, then you're happy and you can give up. Now, look at that plot. From 0 to 180 degrees, the amount of time taken rises in a perfectly straight line, almost. That's as near a straight line as you get in behavioral experiments. And that's true for the same trials and it's true for the different trials. After 180, that's a reflection, that's just the same data as it were, mirrored over. So what this clearly demonstrates is that the spatial layout of the shapes matters. The geometry here really matters. And sentences don't have geometries and images do have geometries. So the amount of time needed to respond depended directly on the amount that the shapes would have to be rotated to demonstrate alignment in the real world. This was very strong evidence that in doing this task, subjects were thinking, they were working very hard with their thoughts, whatever that means, 
and it was not sentence-like. It had more the properties of an image than a sentence. This was only the opening salvo. This debate has gone on and on and on and rages today, 50 years later. Not in the same terms, but at the peak of the computational fever, it seemed like this was the kind of question that would ultimately have a clear answer. Turns out it doesn't have a clear answer. But it's important to realize what's at stake here. We're asking, we're trying very hard through the construction of specific forms of inquiry by asking people questions as they do tasks. We're trying to find out how they, what the nature of thought is. Is it language-like? Is it imagistic? Or could we find other words for it?